uh, welcome back. So, we are continuing with module 2. What we have learnt in this module so far is the inorganic chemicals. So, we have started with the sulphur and uh, then we saw the Claus process and also the sulphur dioxide conversion. Now, from sulphur we actually move a very important inorganic base chemical that is ammonia. So, we will see what is the ammonia in this particular lecture, the ammonia synthesis and also the kinetics. So, when I mean kinetic means I will discuss the reactors which are available currently in the industries. So, the lecture starts with thermodynamics and kinetics of ammonia synthesis. So, what I will cover in this lecture is I will cover the background of ammonia, why this ammonia production is very important in today's perspective. Then the applications of ammonia, so as you can see the ammonia has a large number of applications, applications ranging from fertilizers, from chemicals, from intermediates, so many applications are there, we will see those. Uh, so, what we will decide is in the previous, I mean the next classes, we will take up the fertilizer, one of the fertilizer, you know it is a well known fertilizer from ammonia, it is called the urea. So, urea protections, production requires ammonia as the feedstock and it is reacted with carbon dioxide. So, this is we will see in detail in the ensuing lectures. Then uh, we will go to the reactions and thermodynamics of this ammonia synthesis, we will see in details. Then finally, we will see some commercial ammonia synthesis reactors. So, because these are the companies you are well known, you must be uh, aware of this company that is ICI Imperial Chemical Industries which has a quench reactor, then Kellogg, Kellogg's also make this uh, quench reactors. So, and then the Halder Topso. So, Halder Topso is a very famous company which we will be taking up much more details regarding their catalyst formulation, their reactor formulation in the later when we discuss the homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. Then finally, we will see an example of a multi bed converter with indirect cooling. So, these uh, there are two types of cooling which you require because it is a exothermic process. So, you require a indirect, so these are all direct cooling, this one all are direct cooling examples and we have a indirect cooling also where we have multiple pet converter with indirect cooling, we will see that as we go ahead. So, ammonia is the second most manufactured chemical after sulphur, sulfuric acid, this is majorly used in agriculture as fertilizer. Now, if you see where, what are the different production amount of inorganic base chemicals that has been produced worldwide, it is a mega ton. So, if you see sulfuric acid leads the way close to 190 megatons per year, then the second is the ammonia, then it comes nitric acid, chlorine and caustic soda NOH. So, if you see this, this huge number 160, so uh, these are uh, usually uh, some used, so if I, I have written C green, what do you mean by this green means the sulfuric acid and ammonia, mainly they are useful in the production of fertilizers. So, the greatest production or greatest use of these two inorganic based chemical is the fertilizer industry. So, these three basically, the sulfuric acid, ammonia, nitric acid all are either precursors for the fertilizer manufacture. Then the blue one chlorine is, you know, you it can be used for the manufacture of a polymer. Uh, polyvinyl chloride PVC, you know, PVC is well uh, dominant, if you see the types of pipes we make, you lay down the material of the construction is PVC, the polymer. Then the sodium hydroxide is usually used in the paper manufacture, huh? so you have the cellulose, these are digested and added with sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide is added. So, these are all used in the paper industry, so these are the different uses for the inorganic based chemicals. So, let us see where they are started. So, initially in the 20th century, in the early 20th or the 19th century, late 19th century, so they use these forms of the ore, the saltpeter, saltpeter that is potassium nitrate, then chili salt paper, sodium nitrate and then guano is called the seabird dropping. Well, all these things have already been replaced in the early 20th century because earlier these were used as natural fertilizers, okay. So, now from there they have to separate this ammonia, from there they have to make ammonia, but now it has been replaced. So, what is the way out, what is the process which has been replaced, Just you must be aware it is a Haber's process, the famous the Haber's process, we will discuss today in detail, Haber's process. Okay. Because uh, we can always say that okay, can we just make it you know, directly from air because air has nitrogen, because you need a nitrogen. So, 
if you are react with hydrogen you will get ammonia but no that's not possible because this separation of this nitrogen so even if you want to separate out nitrogen from air it's a very commercial it's infeasible because you need a lots of energy because it's, it has to be in a cryogenic setup cryogenic distillation so it's actually it's commercially infeasible so it's gave away so what we right now we do is we have our, so nitrogen so we have the feed gases which is nitrogen and hydrogen coming together so in this case you will see the even they come together at a normal pressure it does not react very less reaction is possible so we move ahead and that's why the terms this catalyst comes into the picture so let us see first the background of ammonia earlier people found that the nitrogen can be fixed by calcium carbide to form calcium cyanamide and from calcium cyanamide it can be hydrolyzed with water to form ammonia. So uh, in air you know you have this nitrogen and oxygen so what they did is in earlier you have this uh, first you fix the prepare calcium carbide this is the calcium carbide it is formed when you react the calcium oxide with coke to form carbon monoxide which is again a gas carbon monoxide then this calcium carbide what it will do it is inert towards oxygen but it is reactive towards nitrogen it will react with nitrogen to form calcium cyanamide plus coke this then is hydrolyzed to form calcium carbonate and ammonia this was the earlier production but this could not be implemented because of some issues with the commercial production so what are the so naturally there has to be some alternative process so if you see the top producer of ammonia in the world is china 33 percent russia then india then usa so these are the major countries four largest countries the ammonia production because uh, the ammonia production if I, is a, as I told you earlier the sulfuric acid along with ammonia productions are the indicator of a country's economy. So it means that you require more of these means you are producing goods which require this. So ultimately you know economy the gross domestic product GDP all this increases. So this is sometimes used as a key indicator what is the production done. If you see the China is way ahead in terms of ammonia production as compared to India but we are around with USA and Russia. So if you see the annual ammonia production in worldwide ammonia production so it has been increased steadily I have data till 2014 so it is around 176 million metric tons. So nowadays a modern ammonia plant can produce close to 750, 7 thousand metric tons per year okay. So this is the way earlier method failed because of its infeasibility. So let us see what are the applications of ammonia. Ammonia can be directly used as a solid fertilizers. So it is a raw material for solid fertilizer. So it is consumes 40 percent of ammonia usage. Okay. So what are the solid fertilizers which we are know? So you know this NPK mostly this nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK fertilizers are common. So you see all these are there. Ammonium nitrate fertilizer is there. Ammonium sulfate, then ammonium phosphate. So if you know that there is a famous fertilizers trade name as DAP, DAP diaminophosphate so diaminophosphate is regularly given for the plants so this is one of the fertilizer which is commonly used where it is manufactured from ammonia as a feedstock then uh, you have some industrial application as well amines nitriles and certain nitrogen compounds are intermediates for example they are used in the fine chemical industries and another important application if i talk it's an environmental application is that the liquid ammonia can be used for the removal of harmful gases such as NOx and SOx. So this liquid ammonia if you pass counter currently with these gases it will try to absorb this okay. If it absorbs means it will be able to remove these gases. So most of the global production of ammonia is based on steam reforming of natural gas followed by secondary reforming with air. So what are the sources? Steam reforming of natural gas. So steam reforming of natural gas means you are having uh, the hydrogen separated out from natural gas and then you have the nitrogen and you react with this you get the ammonia. All a significant quantity is also for the coal gasification ultimately whether it is coal or steam reforming you are producing syngas primarily syngas is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So from there you can take up this hydrogen so for example if you want to produce more of hydrogen less of carbon monoxide there are certain methods which we will discuss later. So you can always obviously produce more of hydrogen so that is a method of producing hydrogen. So hydrogen can be produced from either uh, from natural gas or by coal. So more than 85 percent of ammonia produced annually is consumed in the multi manufacture of fertilizer. 
So you see how important this production of fertilizer is from ammonia. So 85 percent, our countries also use a lot of, because if you uh, follow the news, we give subsidy in urea and what is urea? Urea again is coming from the ammonia only, these are the precursors. Ammonia is a precursor for urea. So that is why this is very important for the state of health of the economy of any country. So these are the uses. So if you see if the ammonia, so you can uh, either do a oxidation process, you form nitric acid or you or to do either you do a partial oxidation, you can form hydrogen cyanide or from hydrogen cyanide or you can directly use ammonia, you add this with propylene to form acrylonitrile. Acrylonitrile is one of the important compound for polymer industries. Then you add water to form this hexamethylene tetramine then or you add, uh, you can do a epoxidation. If you do a epoxidation, you get this alkanolamines which are the way which can scrub out the carbon dioxide CO2. So methyl, methyl, ethyl, alkanolamyl and then so alkanolamines which has the alcohol and amine group then DIPA, so it is diisopropyl alkalomine. So you have this, if you have this two moles of this particular peroxide, so you can easily, uh, you know, you can convert this to alkalomine. Then you add uh, alcohol, methanol, you produce amines, the methyl amine, then secondary amine, then tertiary amine. These are all methyl amines. Or you can also add carbon dioxide to form urea. So, this we will take up in the next lecture, this is a very important aspect we will discuss or add with nitric acid to form the ammonium nitrate or react with ammonium phosphate, sorry not nitric acid you get ammonium nitrate as one of the fertilizer or you add with phosphoric acid you will get ammonium phosphate. This also we will discuss later or you add with sulfuric acid which I already discussed to form ammonium sulphate. So, these are all the fertilizers, the above top half are all fertilizers. Okay. So, you see the range of products from ammonia, you have the fertilizers at one end, you have the alkanolamines at another end, you have the polymer precursor at one end, then methylamines and it. so it is a useful chemical, this one, so you can say it is a base chemical. Okay. So, let us go to the reaction and thermodynamics. So, a simplest form of the equation which we will be trying to work out is the reaction of nitrogen with hydrogen. It looks very simple, but the issue is this nitrogen is not at all easy to break okay, because it is very inert. So this is a reaction which occurs, so you have 1 mole of nitrogen, 3 moles of hydrogen to form 2 moles of ammonia. So the overall enthalpy is minus 91.44. So we could not do, because what happened is if you take this, all these 3 at uh, normal uh, room temperature, one atmospheres. So, not even if you take stoichiometric amounts, let us say you take 1 mole of nitrogen and 3 moles of hydrogen, if you take hardly there will be 0 0.001 mole percent of ammonia formed. So, the reaction is not at all possible at normal pressure. Okay. So, now what they do is Haber said that okay, it is not possible, it is not possible to produce ammonia in this manner because the reason is it is highly stable and the inert nature. So, you see the bond dissociation energy, why it is not possible? For nitrogen it is 945, you have to supply these much amount of energy to break the nitrogen nitrogen bond, which is just about 439 if you are talking about the methane gas. Methane gas is, you know, it is natural gas, so it is already you can do some steam reforming or partial oxidation to produce syn gas. So, it is easy to break. So, it is almost half the amount of energy required. Now, see the ionization enthalpy. So, ionization enthalpy means if I want to take nitrogen ion and I separate one of the, uh, you try to add an electron. So, you see amount of energy required is almost 1165 as compared to a very high value of 1503. Okay. Then the electron affinity, so if it can pair or if it can react with any other compound. So, see this much energy is required in order to form bond which is almost, I mean which is negligible for oxygen. So, this is the reason that is the electron affinity primarily these two regions, the electron affinity for nitrogen is exceptionally high, it is almost 1000 times than that of oxygen. 
So, what he did it means this cannot go on normally it has to have a catalyst. Now, here the first time I am taking care of the catalyst we have seen the catalyst in the sulfuric acid part also the class process also uh, where we have seen that is a vanadium pentoxide as a catalyst in sulfuric acid. Here he proposed a iron based catalyst. Now, it is not, not easy how to make that iron catalyst because you need to something uh, support for the iron whether the iron should be in the metallic form the oxide form and if they would be reacting with onto the surface because these reactants would come onto the surface and then again react and then diffuse. So, what he did close to he tested 6500 catalyst not iron it has several other transition metal catalysts. So, this transition metal catalyst has tested so many things finally, he came about and found that a multi promoted iron based catalyst is the most useful for the conversion. So, what is said that nowadays what you do you would not get a total 100 percent conversion you may get 30 or 40 percent conversion which is good enough because the effluents that is the products they can be separated the unreacted products can be separated and again recycled after pressurizing back to the reactor. So, you can easily do a recycling part you do not need to go for 90 and 100 percent every time you do that is very difficult to do. So, in industrial viewpoint what they do is they will do a reactor then they will pressurize it and then send back to the reactor because when you send back to the reactor you send it as a cold feed it will take the heat of reaction. So, in that way the reaction is also controlled. So, let us move ahead. So, now it has been seen that uh, a high pressure and a low temperature are the favorable ammonia production. So, for favorable ammonia production you require high pressure and low temperature. So, let us look at this figure. So, you have temperature on the y axis and you have ammonia content in the x axis. So, what, what is it? We have taken a stoichiometric mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen and then use this temperature and pressure conditions. So, pressure you see there are several, uh, several isobars. So, green ones are at very high pressures is around close to 1000 bars this one while as you go towards this side it, it reduces to 50 bars. So, what do you see because uh, the issue is somewhere you have to draw a line because if you go below. So, you see that uh, ok fine this is around uh, well, well it is around uh, 40 bars 50 bars you are getting 40 percent why not I go here why not I reduce the temperature but no that is not feasible because if you go below this temperature keeping pressure constant at 50 bar the rate of reaction will be less. So, rate of reaction decreases so do not go that. So, but if you go at a high pressure if you go at the high pressure let us say 1000 bars at this particular 1000 bars is not easy to achieve. It is a huge amount of compression cost is required, but why do you need it because if you can recycle the product why do you need it. So, I think that is what, what they decided is this is good enough. So, what they found out is the inlet temperature they keep it around 675 and the exit temperature is around 720 because there is a heat of reaction pressure between 100 to 50 bar because kinetic emission the rate of reaction slows down if you go below 570 Kelvin. So, 570 Kelvin that is what I told you this is this temperature. So, you just that is why I, I have not made a or I have not extended this isobars to the lower part because this is the temperature 570 Kelvin they say that the kinetics is very slow. But at a very high temperature mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen in a ratio of 3 is to 1 unable to even to produce ammonia at normal pressure. So, even if you go this part so if you see at a high pressure at high temperature so let us say I kept the pressure all the curves whether it is 50 bar or 1000 bars it the conversion reduced the ammonia content is reduced. So, the Im important thing is you usually do it in this region which is around uh, let us say a temperature of 700 to 800 and a pressure of 40 to 50 bar 700 to 800 let us say 700 to near about this 700. So, if I draw this here temperature is between 700 to 1800 bars this is the where the industrial production occurs ok and uh, temperature is 700 to 650 pressures they may vary from say I have written here 100 to 1 to 50 bars ok. 
so if you see I have made a 100 bar somewhere here, so there are maybe plants which are operating in this region only. So it means that you may get ammonia content ranging from 10 to 40 percent, okay. So this is where the industrially the plants are operated. So you can see even at a high temperature you are not able to produce any ammonia at 1 bar pressure. So you require a low pressure and a high pressure, low temperature and high pressure, these are the essential. So now the issue is how to put this, how to make a reactor out of all this. Uh, because this feed gas, if you see ammonia, you are made from nitrogen and hydrogen. The feed gas, for example, the hydrogen, uh, it has to be heated. Both these gases has to be heated. Anyway, nitrogen, even if it is heated, it won't uh, dissociate. But hydrogen can react with the steel reactor, and uh, it may form products which may embrittle the steel. Okay, so in order to avoid that you should uh, either change the material of construction or you should not have uh, such a severe conditions where hydrogen is in direct contact with the vessel lining. Okay. So, for that you require special reactors. So, these special reactors may be differentiated based on the flow type, it may be axial, it may be radial, you cross flow or it may be cooling method. So, cooling method means primarily if I want talking about cooling method, I am talking about the temperature control. So, temperature control means I can have direct cooling or indirect cooling. Direct cooling is something we called as, we term them as quench reactors. So, this quench reactors as the name suggests will be used throughout in the other modules because this quench reactors what is do, what are its function is, it will take in cold feed gas. Basically, you instead of cooling with an external agent, what you do is, you directly cool with the feed, but at a cold temperature. So, it is called cold gas or quench gas, so quenching is there, okay. It takes away. So, what it does is, it will heat up the feed gas. Indirect cooling is something else. What you do is, you, there is a catalyst bed. So, you can cool them directly and indirectly. So, this is indirectly. Indirectly means, you put heat exchanger in between catalyst bed. So, they should be separate apartment. Suppose you are uh, putting the reducing the heat by generating boiler feed water, you need to have it separate, okay. Otherwise, it should not be contact with the feed gas. So, it should be separate containment. So, that is what it is, you need a heat exchanger between the catalyst bed. The heat exchanger will produce, you have boiler feed water as inlet and you produce steam as the outlet. Now, let us see one by one each of the reactor. So, first we go to the ICI quench reactors. So, in the ICI quench reactors, what they do is they have a feed effluent heat exchanger. So, feed effluent heat exchanger implies that a typical, it is a heat exchanger, it will allow the cold feed to enter through that heat exchanger and exchange heat, get heated up. It will take up the heat of the products and it will pass this heat of the products to the initial feed gas. So, how is the quench ICI quench reactor made? I just show you uh, how it is made. So, you have uh, if I want to uh, draw the entire figure if you see, so because it is a proprietary uh, uh, diagram, so I cannot uh, you know reproduce it here. So, you have a reactor, so if I want to make a reactor here. So, suppose this is the basic diagram I am making. So, what you do is you insert feed from the top. You insert feed from the top, okay. So, feed enters here. Now, you have a bed. Actually, the bed is continuous. The bed is continuous. So, it is inside you have a structure something like this. Okay. Now, you have a distributor something like this here. And here you have a feed effluent heat exchanger. 
So, this is if I want to write down here it is the feed effluent So, it allows the feed to interact or exchange heat with the effluents that type of exchanger. Now, this is uh, the entire catalyst bed. So, this one, uh, so uh, this is let us say I make a bed, these are the beds, this is the one bed, this is actually overall this is a bed and this is a since it is a axial type of reactor. So, I have made a uh, provision where the gases can pass through it. So, now what happens is uh, you do not feed it directly to the catalyst bed uh, because otherwise then what happens is you will have a enormous high temperature within the reactor. So, your production will be lower because your uh, conversion can only be higher if you are able to remove the heat. So, as to increase the rate of reaction what do you do? You send a part of the feed I mean the first what you do you send the entire feed here. So, now it is the cold feed ok it comes out here. Now, this serves two purpose, what it serves is the hydrogen here. So, if you say it is hydrogen means nitrogen. Now, this hydrogen is not in contact, the hot hydrogen is not in contact with the carbon based internal. So, there will be no embrittlement, ok. Embrittlement means like corrosion we say, but it is not corrosion basically in the case of carbon type of shell it is you take the surface is eroded if you react with carbon. So, avoid that the feed is kept as cold. Now, when it comes here then it will enter here ok. So, once this actually what you do is it enters here and exchanges now it gets heated up. So, this is the feed effluent heat exchanger. So, in one way you have the product coming out and in the other way the cold feed is going down. So, you the heat is actually produced and what then what you do you have the product discharge here the ammonia production. Then there can be another way we can do is here you have a provision of catalyst discharge. So, you can replace the catalyst because it is a continuous bed there is no uh, compartment catalyst discharge ok. So, you can take out the catalyst. Now, these are the annular pores through which the gases goes up after exchanging heat and similarly the gases which are coming out down. Now, what you do is as I told you it is what happens does it go in and then because if you go in then what happens is the temperature will rise from the bottom to the top. So, to avoid that as I told you the name suggests quench you do a quenching, quenching means you introduce some part of the feed in the different catalyst region. So, let us say one of the region is this, so if I want to insert a another Okay. So, I am here introducing a quench gas. So, if I want to write here quench gas, quench gas. So, so you are sending cold feed gas. So, cold feed you are sending at different catalyst bed. So, if I want to, uh, so what it happens is they are just distributors. So, these are the quench distributors ok. So, if I want to write down these are just simply the quench gas, quench gas distributors. So, this is no physical compartment. So, if I can write down you can write down this way. So, you can write it up as a, a bed 1 you can say this is bed 1, this is bed 2 and this is bed 3. So, now you see because these are the distributor of the quench gas the gas is divided between different units. So, you can see that is why if when you send cold feed gas heat of reaction is consumed in the case of. So, once it 
it comes here. So, all these gases will also come here from here to distribute it here, here, here and then it will come down and pass through the feed exchange and feed effluent heat exchanger. It can also, it has also has a, so you can also start up the reaction automatically. It has a separate provision where you can start up means you add a certain amount of gas directly to the catalyst bed to make it warm and it to start up the reaction. Now, this is that is why you have these three beds and if I want to draw, if I want to draw this, uh, let us say if I want to draw a temperature versus conversion plot for this type of what would it look like? So, see if I want to write this, the y axis is ammonia content in mole percent and the x axis becomes temperature in Kelvin. Okay. So, what is the temperature of the different beds? So, now see what happens. So, uh, with temperature to ammonia concentration, if I want to draw some values, put some values is 850 Kelvin, then 800 Kelvin, then you say it is 750, let us say it is 650 here, 650, then 700, then uh, let us say 750, okay, like that as maybe this been 780, okay. And ammonia conversion because we know the conversion is not be very high. So, in this case it is hardly 20 percent for the ICI quench reactors. So, there will be two curves, you know this is the equilibrium curve. And then another curve will be which is the maximum rate. So, this is the maximum rate you can achieve and this is the maximum concentration you can achieve. So, which is maximum rate curve. So, this is governed the equilibrium curve is governed by thermodynamics while maximum rate curve is governed by the kinetics. So, if it is kinetics it means we need to have a lower temperature because we are taking out so, initially see uh, it is enters at 650 Kelvin. So, this is where we have. So, because since it enters here in bed 3 temperature will rise. So, if it rises it will go something like this. Then because of this quench gas being uh, sent in bed 3 and bed 2 it will again fall down the temperature. Then again you have the conversion happening here between bed 3 and bed 2 it will rise. Again because of this bed 2 you have the gases distributed here, it is a cold gas, heat will be again controlled, it will come down again here. Then again on the last bed 1 there is nothing to be sent quench gas, it again increases. So, this is the way they do actually this entire bed temperature profile carries out. So, you have a higher uh, con it so it lies close to the maximum road. So, this is the way the most of the actually this direct cooling is actually obtained. So, similar uh, reactors have also been developed by other companies one of them is Kellogg. The Kellogg company what they have done is so in the Kellogg quench reactors. So, you have uh, two different variants of it one is the vertical ones one is the horizontal ones, the vertical ones are axial flow, horizontal ones it will be a cross flow. So, let us see what is the vertical one in the case of Kellogg's. So, if I want to draw it here, so you have a In this Kellogg's reactor in the earlier case the feed was sent from the top, but here the feed is sent from the bottom. So, the feed will enter here feed. Now, obviously, if the feed is entering here the feed effluent heat exchanger will be at the top, it cannot be at the end because then uh, it has to exchange it only at the top because otherwise again the same thing you will have uh, the problem with as you do the embrittlement of steel. So, the exchanger is somewhere here, feed effluent heat exchanger is here. So, I am not drawing the details of it. So, 
this is the feed effluent okay so what they will do instead of a continuous catalyst bed they will make compartments of catalyst bed so compartment of catalyst bed will work in a similar manner so you have another casing inside so gas is entering here again it is going up all the feed gas is going up here going up here up here exchanging heat with the feed effluent heat exchanger and then entering inside while the products are coming out so the products here are coming out from the top now what you do what they have done is you have this bed so in between there is a central portion and you have the bed here like this okay so two bed third bed and fourth bed so if i want to make some distinction in the bed these are the beds catalyst beds okay so these are the different catalyst beds now what you do is you send the quench gas from the top let's say this is the quench gas so what you do you send the quench gas at the top and uh, send it here then again come down send it here send it here so these are the different ways where the quench gas is sent so quench gas is then sent and it is divided into different catalyst bed okay so obviously these gases come out here so there will be reaction here also there will be reaction but the temperature is then controlled once this reaction is completed most of the gases escape here once they are converted the remaining will come down here it is converting okay so this is the way so you are sending the gases in intermediate location so you that's why you make the temperature to be controlled so these are the all the catalyst beds okay these and these all the catalyst beds okay you send them separately in different beds so this is the way kellogg does it but the only issue is here if you see this type of diagram you have this different catalyst bed issue is about the pressure drop and if the particle size is small the pressure drop will be huge so to avoid this catalyst bed and to avoid the pressure drop kellogg's then modified their uh, diagram and they came up with a horizontal cross flow reactor so how is it similar manner it is made so we have the horizontal cross flow reactor in this what you do is here uh, you have a reactor in a similar manner you have a reactor here similar manner as before you have a feed effluent part in the initial part okay so you have the feed entering here the reactor and you will have a quench gas stream entering here this is the quench gas stream so let's say it enters somewhere here somewhere here okay so this is the quench gas inlet quench gas inlet so same thing you just invert it basically you have the feed effluent heat exchanger here feed effluent heat exchanger okay 
Now, uh, here you again have a casing here. What you do is in the casing, you have the entire gas getting up. So, in this casing, you have a catalyst bed here. Let us say this is the catalyst bed, one of the catalyst bed. Then uh, this supported another one. This is the catalyst bed here. Then uh, you have uh, another one here, let us say. Okay. So, if quench gas is coming out here, here and the inlet gas again is sent here. It goes here, the inlet gas, it goes here, exchanges heat with the feed ex effluent heat exchanger. Some of the effluents, once they react, get find their way out. The ammonia production is, the product is formed here. Then the remaining, there will be a cross flow arrangement. The gases are coming out here, again it is coming here, then it is coming out here, reacting out. So, there is a cross flow arrangement within the reactor. So, what are the uses of this? The uses is that the, in this, it is a larger catalytic area per unit volume. So, the larger catalytic area per unit volume when you compare to the vertical one per unit, per unit volume and lower pressure drop. These are the two important advantages for this type of reactor. A larger uh, catalytic area per unit volume and lower pressure drop and you can use a smaller catalyst size also because higher catalytic size you use in the vertical one, pressure drop will be more even with a smaller catalyst size because if you have the catalyst size to be small, obviously the area is also improved. Because of this, this has been used, specially used in those cases where the capacities are to be more than 1700, greater than 1700 tons per day, greater than 1700 tons per day. So, this is a cross flow pattern. Okay? So, you have this as an example of cross flow pattern. Okay, so, we move ahead and see the last reactor which is we are to discuss, the Halder Topso. So, it has a radial flow reactor, it has two annular catalyst bed through which the gas flow in radial direction. Now, it is a radial direction. Heat exchanger is located at the bottom, helps in the upward flow of feed through the central pipe towards catalyst bed at the top. So, both this horizontal converter, the previous one and the pre in this one currently which we are discussing can be used as indirectly cooled reactor. So, we have the direct one as the vertical one and the ICI one and the indirect ones as the, uh, the horizontal one and the Haldertropse one because I will explain it once. Let me show you what the diagram looks like for this one. So, here also you have the similar uh, way you have uh, the reactor inlet. So, you have a product formation outside, product is formed and getting out and the feed is coming in so feed comes in same way as before. So, you have a catalyst bed which is annular, you see the two annular catalyst bed. So, if I want to draw it correctly, it will be something like this. So, maybe I just draw, okay, annular catalyst bed. So, if I want to draw the inter inner structure of the catalyst beds, something like this. So, you have a feed effluent heat exchanger here. So, this is the feed effluent heat exchanger. Okay. The feed effluent heat exchanger. Then the annular part is somewhat it will have a central portion here a central portion and you have then two parts. So, this is one of the part and this is the other part. Okay. So, these all are catalyst beds. So, 
So, if I want to draw it here, this is one catalyst bed and I will draw it here, this is the other catalyst bed. So, these are the two annular catalyst beds in which the gas flow in radial direction. So, what happens as before you send the feed here, so they will come here as before earlier and then they will exchange heat with the effluents and enter. So, what happens is it will go up here, the gases, it gases goes up here. After passing through the annulus, it flows radially, first it will flow radially to the first catalyst bed. Once it does that, passes through the first catalyst bed, then it goes down to flow inward together with the quench gas. So, it will go down into the second catalyst bed radially. There is a quench gas which has been sent inside. This is a quench gas. So, quench gas is sent somewhere here in between the second catalyst, the second annular portion. So, once the reaction occurs in the above top catalyst bed, so it will come down because of the heat generated you add quench gas in the second catalyst bed. With this it cools down and then the reaction takes place, again it goes into this few different heat exchanger. So, you have an annular type of combination. So, again you say these two catalyst beds are separate, that is why we call this as indirect cooling. So, in direct cooling there are two ways, this is the halder top so and the earlier one is the Kellogg's horizontal. Okay. So, these are the two examples for the ammonia synthesis reactor where indirect heating mode is required. Okay. So, we move ahead and we see now the indirect way, another indirect manner. So, multi bed converted with inverter cooling. So, how does this takes place? So, multi bed in this is the way most of the nowadays it is done. So, what happens here is you have converter So, this is multi bed I will make it. So, these are the different entry points for the gas beds. So, feed is here coming, the feed is coming here, feed is coming here. Okay. So, you have the beds like this. So, again I will not draw here. So, this is you can say some uh, separate unit where you allow the feed to pass through and another unit where you allow the products to pass through some sort of arrangement. So, if you see there is one arrangement where you allow the products to pass through the product to pass through. So, the importance is you have a catalyst bed here let us say and you have let us say another catalyst bed here, another catalyst bed here. All these are in the some sort of casing, okay. the casing has to be a bit casing. Okay. So, the gases when they are sent here, some of them it will go out here, it goes out here as before, it enters here, it goes up, it enters the first catalytic bed, this is the first catalytic bed, the second catalytic bed, this is the third catalytic bed. Now, what you do is that you send and you have another compartment in this part and in this part where you have a boiler feed water inserted here, boiler feed water. Okay. So, feed enters here, goes down. So, as it enters here, temperature will rise, it will cool down. So, boiler feed water enters here, becomes steam here. Again, BFW enters here, becomes steam because it cools the. So, again temperature rises, again cools down, again temperature rises, again it cools down. So, I can maybe this bit is incorrect. So, we have the product coming here as well as well as here. We can say all our product feed gas. So, feed gas is fed uh, here in this region and the product is here. 
so feed gat is, is somewhere fed uh, maybe i am not able to make it but it is somewhere because of the three dimensional nature i can write here feed gas is sent at the bottom it goes up because this is cold feed gas it goes up and enters this cat first catalytic bed reaction occurs cooling occurs again reaction occurs cooling occurs reaction occurs and then finally the product gets out so this is the way that there is no quench gas arrangement here so if i want to draw this different figures with height what is the temperature if i want to draw out this part you have the temperature in kelvin let's see how the temperature varies across these beds okay so this is let's say i start with 300 400 then you have this 500 600 then 700 800 like that and you have the height this is the height so for with height how does the temperature vary so if you see the initially the feed is very cold because there is no heat exchanger so there is that's why i have not written here there is no feed effluent heat exchanger so it will rise like this but the temperature so if i want to draw something here it will be easier to identify so make some lines i extend them so another line here for the starting of the feed so it will go here so reaction will only start at 600 kelvin so at this only when 600 kelvin is achieved then only the reaction will start okay so then uh, what you do is uh, because it will be heated up little bit while it enters it goes up so temperature increases not much because there is no reaction so it will go up 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 okay, it goes up then finally as it enters the catalyst bed the temperature rises here again it is cooled here again it rises the second i'm sorry so because the temperature rise so actually this uh, this here the temperature will rise actually it rises then in portion this will be cooling and again rising then again cooling then it rises again okay and it is cooled and finally uh, the exhaust gases are again cooled because some of this exhaust gas is already at a very low temp this temperature it will try to heat up the inlet feed so it will also fall down like this the exhaust gases so this is the way the entire temperature of the effluent gases and the product distribution is uh, captured so see the temperature it is not allowed allowing it to rise beyond this point because the drop of the temperature from this 700 because i told you the uh, optimum is around 670 kelvin so the drop of the temperature is always across this heat exchanger so this heat exchanger and the catalyst bed there that's why kept separately so this was about the multi bed converter so this will also have a similar temperature profile which i have dis discussed about the ici quench reactor so with this we actually stop here with the ammonia synthesis so what we will do now so let us summarize now so the highlights what have we seen the ammonia synthesis reactors are classified based on the flow type the axial radial and cross flow and also the cooling method because of the exothermic nature of the ammonia synthesis they can be controlled during direct cooling and indirect cooling direct cooling we use quenching by cold feed gas at different heights in the reactor indirect cooling we use separate heat exchanger between catalyst beds kellogg's horizontal converter provided a larger catalytic area per unit volume at a lower pressure drop for an indirect cooling type reactors heat can be recovered at the highest possible temperature we have seen in the previous slide so the cost of indirect cooling is higher due to the cost of the heat exchanger the only advantage downside in the previous example what we seen is that the cost that is you need to have a separate heat exchanger it is not a single unit you need a heat exchanger as well as a catalyst bed separately so it increases the cost so i'll stop here so you should go through this molins book and also uh, just go through the clause catalysis and the selective oxidation 
and the introduction to ammonia production which is available as the AI CHV resources where you will get the total entire process concerning the ammonia production. Thank you. Thank you.